Welcome to Pure Nonfiction, the podcast covering documentary film. I'm your host, Tom Powers, the documentary programmer for the Toronto International Film Festival and for New York's Stranger Than Fiction screening series at IFC Center. On this episode, we hear from the five directors who are Oscar-nominated for Documentary Feature in 2017. All of them were interviewed on Pure Nonfiction in the past year. Now we've pulled together highlights from those conversations in one place. Our first nominee is Roger Ross Williams, the director of Life Animated. He was previously known for two films set in Africa, the Oscar-winning short Music by Prudence about a singer with disabilities, and the feature-length God Loves Uganda about religious persecution of the LGBT community. His new film is set in the U.S., inspired by the book Life Animated by Ron Suskind. The author wrote about raising his son Owen, who has severe autism. As a child, Owen didn't speak for years. Then he started using dialogue from Disney cartoons to express himself. The film combines documentary footage with animation to tell the story of Owen, who's now in his 20s. There's a scene in the film that recalls a breakthrough moment in Owen's childhood. His father, Ron, put on a hand puppet of the Disney character Yago, who's a sidekick in Aladdin. Ron used the puppet to talk to Owen. Here's Ron and Owen in the film. And Owen turns to the puppet like he's bumping into an old friend. I say to him, Owen, Owen, how does it feel to be you? And I said, not good, because I don't have any friends. Now I'm under the bedspread, and I just bite down hard. You know, I just say to myself, stay in character. And I say, okay, okay. Owen, when did you and I become such good friends? And he said, when I watched Aladdin, you made me laugh. And then we talk, uh, Owen and Yago, for a minute, minute and a half. It's the first conversation we've ever had. I interviewed Roger last spring during the Montclair Film Festival. I asked how after making two films in Africa, he came to focus on this American family. For me, it was really important not to get sort of pigeonholed into being making only a specific type of film and what had what was happening is i was getting offered um anytime someone had some film project in africa they would come to me <laughs> oh you know same thing like if you know it's either if if you're if you're african american if you're black they come to you with black projects like mm-hmm. you 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 can only you only a black person can make this film um, or only, uh, you know, you, you, Roger's the expert on Africa. So I didn't want that one thing. Um, I knew Ron Suskind for 15 years. Um, and when he first approached me um, about uh, Life Animated, um, you know, I was, you know, I didn't quite get it and there was one moment, I remember I was screening... Did he approach you with the idea of making a film? With the idea of making a film pretty... Like sort of early, early in the process when he was writing the book, mm-hmm. but then he was he. Um, I was sh- I was screening God Loves Uganda in Boston, and he. I met him for breakfast, and he said, "You know, I'm almost I'm close to almost finishing this book." And he ex- described Disney Club to me, and um, something clicked, and I was like, "This is it. This is my next film." I don't know. It just clicked, and I was and um. It's because so what is that Disney Club for people who haven't seen Life Animated? Disney Club is uh, so Owen Suskind, um, the son of Ron Suskind. Yeah, so he, um, I he, he lost his ability at three years old to speak and connect with anyone, and he watched endless Disney animated films for years and years and years. And his first words he uttered was from The Little Mermaid was, 
just your voice. And um, the, his family realized that they could, that he was actually absorbing the movies, but not only absorbing the movies, but, but actually learning about life through the films. And they became Disney animated characters to connect with their son. And they kind of sort of drew him out of the autism. And um, so Owen, who is an expert on everything. He's he's memorized every line of dialogue from every classic Disney film ever made. He learned to read by reading the credits. Um, he can tell you, you can say a name of, a, of an actor, a voiceover actor, and he... Uh, 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 and he will will tell you all the other films they've been in. I mean, he'll give you their resume. Um, so he started a Disney club in his school, and the school is a school for um, uh, kids. It's like kind of college for um, uh, not just um, people living with autism, but people who struggle with diff- various learning disabilities and learning challenges. And they um, and this club became really popular mm. and they would watch a scene and then they would discuss it and, and and they just saw so much more in these films and it was like and for me it was really about um, I think it's about that sort of the power of sort of fables and story these sort of Disney films are classic stories with classic themes and um, and they really embrace that and they use that in their own lives um, so he, Ron was sort of telling me about this, and um, and I was and I, for me, I've what's always attracted me as a filmmaker were you know left behind people who've been left behind mm. music by Prudence left behind you know the it God even God loves Uganda is about people who were left behind um, even though I'm focused on the other side mm-hmm. the, the people who are you know, um, and so. It was sort of a natural fit for me to to tell um, the story of Owen, but it was important for me to tell it from Owen's point of view, from Owen's perspective, and to go to, to try to get into Owen's head and see the world through Owen's eyes. Now, as you approach the story about an autistic man, what were what were your thoughts or ideas or understanding of autism coming into it? I didn't have much of an understanding of autism coming into it. I didn't, unlike a lot of people, I didn't know anyone with autism. Uh, I hadn't, I don't have any connections in my family. So I was a little uncomfortable at first. And um, so as, as I became more comfortable... The, and can you describe what made you uncomfortable? Well, you know, uh, as an uh, Owen, because he's autistic, he's not, he doesn't, you know, he, talk, make eye contact or, or talk, to, you know, he'll, he talks to you, but it's like, you know, there's a, there's a, there's sort of this uh, disconnect and you don't know, you're, you're, you, I just didn't know how to, you know, how to, how was I going to connect with him? Um, I, you know, it was just, you're just awkward. And so, one of the things we did, um, Owen spent his life watching a television screen and connecting to characters on on a television screen. So, I thought I should interview him using an interrotron. Mm-hmm. And an interrotron is a camera invented by Earl Morris that is behind a television screen. So, you're filming someone through the screen and they're looking at the audience directly. Owen is looking at Roger's face on a TV screen, and behind that screen is a camera filming Owen. So that way, Owen can look me in the eyes and really connect. And it was, you know, and I didn't know if it would work. I was amazed by how he was so connected to me, and he was so engaged. And, And I think it... What I want my goal with that was for Owen to connect to the audience, to also connect with Owen. And that slowly over the course of the movie, you will get deeper and deeper into Owen's head. You're in Owen's world. Mm -hmm. You're immersed in Owen's world. The film had its world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival. Owen and his family, they've been to other screenings. What has that experience been like for Owen? I think it's been 
life-changing for Owen. Owen thrives. We didn't know this, but we soon discovered Owen thrives in front of an audience. He understands, maybe from watching all these films, what it means to to sort of perform. He has just thrived and just loves it. And I think, I don't know, I mean, just, there was one at, at, um, at Full Frame... I couldn't even speak in the Q&A because I was in tears because it was so moving to see how happy he was and how happy his parents are despite everything they've been through to get to that point that th- there was over a thousand people cheering Owen on as he made his bows on stage. That was just amazing to me. Our second nominee is Gianfranco Rosi from Italy. His film is Fire at Sea, the only one of the five nominees that relies exclusively on observational filmmaking. It won the prestigious Golden Bear Award at last year's Berlin Film Festival. I interviewed Gianfranco in the fall when the film opened in New York. Fire at Sea is set on the island of Lampedusa that's a destination for refugees seeking a foothold in Europe. Gianfranco films on an Italian Navy ship that rescues refugee boats at sea. He also follows several residents of Lampedusa to understand the island where this flow of migrants takes place. One striking character is Samuele, the 11-year-old son of an Italian fisherman. I remember very clearly this. I have to choose a kid to tell this story because otherwise I'm going to put myself in a very at the corner, you know, because otherwise I will have only to talk about migration and there's no way I can give this, uh, what I wanted, this free identity on the island. Mm. And and then when I met Samuele by chance, um, I felt that he was going to become uh, the my narrator, you know, my voice, uh, because he was a special kid. He was 11 year old when I met him. And it was this tiny, tiny little kid with the head of uh, an old man, you know, almost like a Woody Allen uh, mm. <laughs> of Lampedusa. Including the this, hypochondriac. Uh, yeah. Hypochondria with his wisdom, with this kind of anxiety things. But when I was filming him, I discovered that his inner world was always uh, bringing me to something I was not ready also myself to accept, which was like the, the something arriving out beyond Lampedusa, you know, mm. was always taking me into a different spot. And um, so all his uh, daily life uh, uh, um, inner world, they were somehow metaphor for something bigger constantly. And, and I discovered that when I was filming him, you know, when he invents the, the army and he designed the faces on the cactus. He's, he's creating characters out of cactus on the island so that he can shoot them with his slingshot. When, when he builds his slingshot with the gloves, you know, the gloves of... Uh, they are like paramedic gloves, you know, and then he used them uh, for, to build his own film. For the elastic. Eh? For the elastic and the, the anxiety, the lazy eyes, you know, all these things, uh, this very small movement uh, of his life, they were always, uh, for me, extremely, there was an incredible depth uh, to a, a interior life, to something more deep, which was creating a suspension, which was creating a, an inner story of the film. Gianfranco filmed for 40 days with the Navy at sea. For the first half, he just observed without picking up his camera. For me, it's very important to, to understand first the situation. Also there in this boat, I knew that I have 40 days. And the first 20 days I spent it basically interacting with the whole uh, um, crew, with mm. the captain, and somehow to be sure that the moment I was taking out the camera, I was somehow welcome and trusted, and then I didn't feel like uh, someone from the outside world uh, interfering with their work. So it was a very important training period for me too, to understand the whole uh, um, language of what happened in, in a military boat, you know, and how people move, how people prepare for an event, how people dress, how people live, how people sleep, how people uh, put themselves on this, you know. The title, Fire at Sea, comes from a song called Fukamare that's heard in the film. I 
asked where the song comes from. Yes, also that a, was a very strong moment because of the first encounter I had uh, in Lampedusa was also with this music. With this, so I, I hear that everywhere in this. This one song. This one song. It was a very easy song. Very, well, you immediately sing it the next day, you know? So it's everywhere, the music. And also when I was filming on the radio, there was a lot of requests of this song. So somehow I started getting interested and asking what was, and very few people knew the original of this song, except then I was able to, when I met the, the DJ people, he told me that was a song related to a tragedy that happened during the war, like uh, this uh, Italian military navy was bombed by an aircraft, uh, Al Maddalena was the name of this uh, ship. This is a World War II World War II, song. yes, and was bombed by an, an, a British um, airplane. And there was this, you know, it was a disaster, people died, and there was fire in the sea, the whole island was full of uh, this uh, fire that, you know, there were people, they were looking at night. But what was incredible was related to a big tragedy and death, and yet the song was so light, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and then uh, I felt that somehow was ref reflecting a bit what I wanted to do in this movie, you know, to be telling a story of big tragedy, but also, in a light way, you know, with a kid, with the things, uh, with moments of humor, with moments of uh, where reality is somehow has its own uh, lightness in a Calvino, Calvino Italo Calvino sense, the lightness right. of being. And so, and then somehow became the, it became the title of the film. The, I asked the title of the song was Fuoco Mare, which is almost an oxymoron, you know, Fuoco Mare became almost- Pirate like, Sea. Pirate Sea, yeah, it's like a very political also title and really linked to a tragedy. And then one day, but completely by accident, there was a, the, when I shot the story between the aunt, the, the, the grandmother and the little kid, the grandmother brought out this, um, this uh, episode. And this was only at the end of my shooting. And again, it gave like a, a strength to the title, you know, because the title came out from the- Comes up naturally. Comes up naturally. This area in Lampedusa has been covered, as you said, by lots of journalists. So what do you think your approach is that's different from journalism? Time, because I spent one and a half year there. Time and, uh, and always willing to lose more things that, than able to capture things. Uh, I always put this in my, in my account. You know, I never get anxiety of losing things when I'm there in a place. You know, once I decide, as I said, I would, for the first three months I was without camera there, and I had to meet people, I had to know people, I had to have the structure of my of the film inside of me, and I have to accept that I'm able to, that I know when I start, and I, I never know when this process ends, and this become like a a way of life. I want to ask you about this immersive style uh, of yours because you're in a pretty remote place, whether it's on the island of Lampedusa or uh, at sea for many days. And it's one thing to do that in your 20s um, when you're young and don't have you know, as, as many obligations. But as you get to middle age, the, you have ties to family and friends. And I'm it's, still a it, kid. Eh? <laughs> I'm a 50 years old kid. <laughs> My spirit has to become exactly the same, has to be the same of when I start Boatman, because uh, if I lose that, there's no way I can make film, you know? So I have to have the same kind of spirit and the same, same kind of curiosity. The moment I lose that, I'm gonna stop making films. So for me, it didn't change anything, you know, since I was uh, 25 when I was in India, and now that I'm 50, being in the middle of the sea, it's still exactly the same way I'm working. One man crew, the camera on my shoulder, mm. the camera on the tripod, be really independent and alone. And what I have to have is still the, this curiosity and this enthusiasm of the first film. You know, I, I always say my film is always the first and last that I do. I never give for granted that I can make another film. Our third nominee is Ava DuVernay, who's known for her fiction film Selma and her TV series Queen Sugar. Her nominated documentary is 13th. The film takes its title from the Constitution's 13th Amendment that freed slaves. Ava interviews scholars, politicians, and activists to trace the way racial oppression evolved after slavery, from Jim Crow laws to our present criminal justice system that's full of racial bias. 
Here's a clip from an interview in the film with Republican Newt Gingrich. The objective reality is that virtually no one who is white understands the challenge of being black in America. 13th had its world premiere in September at the New York Film Festival. I spoke with Ava two days later when her voice was hoarse from overexertion. I asked her how she approached the multiple sources for 13th. You know, many people who love documentary know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm extracting information from about, you know, six really great docs. Definitely Sam Pollard, Slavery by Another Name. We have a six-minute kind of synopsis of what he does. Or Gideon's Army. Yeah, Gideon's Army. A little piece about that, because I saw that in her piece. You know, the books, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, Michelle Alexander's New Jim Crow. We can go on a set of the, the, these materials that are kind of the, the starter kit to get into these issues. And yet, we need an even starter starter kit to that kit, right? Something where you put it all in one place. There's something about seeing a doc that's all about plea bargains and, and public public defenders. There's something about seeing a doc that's all about reconstruction and, and black codes and and um, and how slavery uh, uh, was really reenacted during that time. And individually, I think there's something about seeing them back all back to back. Mm. It's like seeing connecting the dots, connecting the dots in one piece. Um, did something to me that I didn't even really expect. You know, a lot of people who know all of this information, wow, but you see it all together and you paint it, see a different picture. It's like seeing the color red on a wall by itself, you know, and then you put it with a bunch of different colors and it creates a different picture. And so I think um, that's what that's what this does here. Yeah, so were there interviews where you thought I was not expecting him to say that or her to say that? Um, no. Um, you were prepped. I, yes, I was very prepared. Even with Newt Gingrich, a lot of people were surprised at what he says. But he'd been talking about that for a while in smaller circles at smaller conferences. So I had expected him to say some of the things that he said. Um, I mean, yeah, certainly you sit down with people and they go deeper um, when you're talking with them for three hours than anything that you've read. But there wasn't any big surprise. Mm -hmm. You have talked about your intentional framing in this film to not deliver some easy answers at the end, to not uh, say, well, this is how it's going to get better. Right. Um, can you talk about that decision? Yeah, no, it was interesting. Last night I was having dinner uh, with uh, with Common, and who has the final song in the film. When I walked up to the table, he was talking to two white women that were standing, sitting next to him. But out of all the people in New York City, he sits down two women who had just been at the screening last <laughs> night in a little dive place. And they were talking about the 13th. And so we got sat down and we started talking to these women. And the woman said, I was just, I thought it was great. I was just surprised you didn't offer any solutions at the end. And I said, it's not for me to offer the solutions. It's for me to just offer you the information. You have to make the solution. That's exactly what this was. I mean, we had had a section with solutions, and it just felt like I let everyone off the hook at the end. You know, the, our final credit sequence was all about everyone in the documentary talking about solutions, talking about the organization they were with, how they're changing things. And you, and you, at the end of that cut, you walked out and you think, wow, good, they've got it. They're going to take care of it. Okay, good. There's some good people on it that I just spent 100 minutes with. I just, I hated it. You know what I mean? I hated it. So I cut that part out because I need people to be on the hook for this. Because at this point, after you learn what you learn in the 13th, in 13th, you know, in this case, silence is consent. You know, if you're a forward thinking person and now you know what you didn't know and you're affected by it and hurt by it and pained by it and feel that it's unjust, then you must do something. And that doesn't necessarily mean protest you know, call your congressman, whatever. This is something in this that's about us and the way that we treat each other and regard each other. What do you think when you hear the word criminal? You know, how do you regard Black Lives Matter movement when you hear that the gas station was burned down? Oh my gosh, they're burning public property? Or now do you think back and think, wow, you know, there's some context to this, there's some, some historical backbone to, you know, this, this new life that's being birthed through Black Lives Matter. So that's the hope. Ava's key collaborator on 13th is Spencer Averick. He's been editing her films since her very first documentary, This is the Life, about a hip-hop community in Los Angeles. I asked her to describe their working relationship. I love him. He's my editor. He's one of my great, great friends of my whole life. You know, he's a light to me. He's who I sit in the dark with for hours and hours and hours trying to make something, you know what I mean? Trying to 
make something to put my name on, our name on, and say, this is an offering from me to, you know what I mean? It's, it's your film. And I always, it always astounds me when I talk to filmmakers and they don't enjoy the editing process because it's my favorite part, hands down, more than the screenwriting, yuck, more than even the glorious feeling of being on set. I cannot wait to get in a dark room with Spencer and start looking at that footage and figuring out how to tell the story. It's really, um, um, I don't know, it's it's like a sacred space to me. And it's because he's there. Young guy, I met him because uh, I needed an editor who would work for cheap. Um, a, a woman I know said, yeah, I know a guy who says he's an editor. I mean, look at, look at a guy who says he's an editor. This is how you find that you're a great <laughs> editor. Yeah, I know a guy who says he's an editor. I was like, great, because I'm desperate. Will he edit? This is the life. Yeah, I only got $1,500. Yeah, no, he's just, he's just trying to get in and do some stuff. Meet this guy. He walks in. I'm literally thinking, can he leave the house without his mother? Like, this kid is so young. He looks so young. And I gave him the audacity, <laughs> the audacity of having $1,500 and asking someone to edit a whole feature-length doc and then saying, let me give you some raw footage and see what you do with it. The audacity of me to ask that, but I did. It's your I baby. Did, <laughs> it was my baby. I gave him some raw footage. He came back. He shined it up. He made it just gleam. He dazzled me. And we've been together ever since, you know, and we've grown together. We've learned to make films together, you know, from This Is The Life, you know, to... So is he someone who has a similar background to you or no, a different background? No, no. He is a young white man from Petaluma, California. <laughs> I don't know where that is. It is, sounds like what it is. You're from a town called Petaluma. It sounds pretty, and it is. He has a beautiful family. Uh, and I had a beautiful family, but we are completely different people. When we stand together and walk around, people look at us like, how are you two connected? You know, but I feel like he's literally my brother from another mother. We have the same mind. The, the 13th, I, I asked him to share a writing credit with me. Um, the 13th, I asked him to take a producer credit. He's like, Ava, why, why? Because we did this together. You know, the film, when you see it, it's really, you know, if there's, there's, I can't, you know, I can't say the, what's masterful about it as it pertains to me, but he did a badass job on the editing. I mean, this material, the tone, the pace to me um, is, is his best work um, because I knew what we had to wrangle. Such a huge topic of such scope. Yeah, talk you know, to me about the pacing because you described that you started with a cut that was super fast, and then you came to yes. then, then you slowed it down, and now you've he found, found the found right the pace and tone. We worked together to try to figure it out. It took a while, you know. We have a four hour cut. We have like a, a Speedy Gonzalez super speed cut that's just you know things are whizzing by and you can't even grasp it. Uh, you have um, the the overcorrection of that cut when we got notes that it was too fast from friends to something that's so slow that you can barely watch it. And so it's just about finding the right times to push on the gas, let go of the gas. Um, you know, and as all documentarians know, that takes time. Um, but with so much footage and with such emotional subject matter, with very violent images, racist images that we were showing and dealing with every day, it was a self-care issue in the editing room, you know, really tough stuff to look at. But also we knew we had the challenge of keeping people's attention through a virtual tour of racism is basically what we were doing, trying to take you from 1865 abolition of slavery to now in a hundred minutes and do that in a way that, you know, was meaningful and emotionally resonant, um, you know, was, uh, was a great challenge and I'm happy to, that I had him by my side. Our fourth nominee is Ezra Edelman, the director of OJ Made in America that retells the life of OJ Simpson set in a larger context of American race relations. When I first heard of this film, I wondered what Ezra could possibly add to the past saturation of OJ coverage. It turns out, quite a lot. The film stretches across seven and a half hours, exploring OJ's journey from football star to actor to accused murderer and convicted felon. I interviewed Ezra last summer when OJ Made in America was playing in theaters and about to debut on ESPN. I reached him by Skype while he was in Los Angeles. I asked what drew him to the OJ story. The things that I am interested in, I'm, I was a history major in college. I'm sort of interested in, you know, I probably could have been an African-American studies major. I could have been an American studies major. And when I sort of started thinking more about 
what this OJ story is combined with the canvas that was being offered, it was, oh, I don't have to focus in on those two years in 1994 and 95. Those are sort of incidental to me. I can actually tell a story that explains what happened in 1994 and 95 and actually and offer context and really examine this history of a city in Los Angeles, the LAPD, the black community here, um, as well as sort of I, what I did sort of get. And because of my background in sports, I knew enough about OJ and I, and I kind of realized that, that he as a character and even, a, and even an appreciation of him as an athlete had been underexplored, especially in light of the events of 94 and 95. And so that's what sort of got me going, just on a sort of almost a pure um, historical interest level of, oh, this is a world that I'm interested in spending time in, even if I'm not particularly interested in the question of who did, who did it, or did he do it, or what, you know, that, that was never a driving force. OJ Made in America gains fresh interviews with many figures, including lawyers from both the prosecution and defense teams in the murder trial. I asked Ezra what it was like getting people to talk. It's safe to say that not a lot of people who were involved with the trial itself were that interested in talking to us. Um, there was, you know, sort of a, there's really, I don't know what the proper metaphor is, but, you know, you basically are calling people up who have built a large wall around them or in front of them to block out people who want to do interviews with them. And, and because of the way that the trial was covered so um, feverishly, you know, and competitively, if not and maniacally during and sensationally during the trial, you know, there's this sense that people are like, OK, enough already. They have either tried to bury it and forget about it um, or they just sort of end up in a place where they know they have to play defense because there is this fascination. And every year on this anniversary of these things, people call them up and want to do stories. And so, you know, when we called them up or wrote them letters, there really was a skepticism, if not an, you know, outright, you know, silence on the other end, because they, you know, what am I going to offer or ask them or do, or how am I going to be different from anyone else? And so there was really, with a lot of people, this hurdle that needed to be, you know, gotten over, which was, can you just listen to what we're doing? We're not focusing on the trial and the murder. We're not relitigating the case. You know, we really are trying to explain it all, and we have this canvas, and, you know, we, I want to sort of talk about the history. I want to talk about everything that went into it, and this isn't like the things that have been done before. This isn't like the interviews, and I think, by and large, if we got a fair hearing with people where we could sit in front of them and explain what our intent was and what we were trying to do and have them listen to the fact that we are pretty sober-minded and we, don't have, we didn't have an agenda, um, people sort of came around. But it took a lot of work. I mean, I'll just use one example. Gil Garcetti is the district attorney. It took me you know, months just to get to him. And I, I got his email through a family friend randomly. And he wrote me back and said, look, I'm not doing an interview, period. If you want to come and chat with me off the record the next time in your L.A., you know, feel free, which I did. And I spent a lovely couple hours at his house. And it was really frustrating because it was just like, this is a conversation that we're just having casually and everything that's coming out of your mouth is exactly the kind of stuff I want to include in this documentary. It's not like a 60 Minutes interview. I'm not trying to grill you. I just want your recollections. And he hadn't done an interview in over 15 years. And he sort of listened to me and said, okay, thanks. And he's like, I still don't want to do this. And I left. And there was another meeting about that in the same way. And he still was reluctant. And finally, in fact, it was his, his son, who was the mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, who convinced him. It helped that it, Eric knows uh, my older brother a little bit. And so I think he told Gil, like, two things. It's time. I think enough time has passed where you can tell your story and people haven't listened to you. And I actually think you might be able to trust him. Like, I know his brother a little bit. I, he's a good dude. You know, maybe it's okay. And once you get sort of, this is specifically on the prosecution front, but once you get somebody to say yes, then everything gets easier. One of the most controversial figures at OJ's trial was the LAPD officer Mark Furman, who uncovered the glove used in the murder. OJ's defense team submitted evidence that Furman had a history of using racist language. Discrediting Furman became a key factor to create reasonable doubt for the jury that led to OJ being found not guilty. In OJ Made in America, Furman comes across as more complicated than he's been portrayed in the past. I asked Ezra what it was like doing that interview. 
that was definitely a long process. And he was, you know, would have been, you know, at the top of the list of difficult people to get to sit in the chair, you know, and understandably because of the way he was portrayed and framed during the trial. And that, you know, he was one of the last people we interviewed. And I really have to give a lot of credit to our producer, Tamara Rosenberg, who was a, you know, a bulldog with everybody. You know, the thing about the project of this scale, as much as I'm used to, you know, being the, you know, the first line when it comes to calling people up and talking to them, you know, I really had to rely on her in many cases to do a lot of the outreach and sort of, you know, and be persistent. And she was, an, you know, an incredible advocate on our behalf. And she really was the one that, through conversations with his agent, um, convinced them and him that this was a, a worthwhile thing to do. Here's Furman speaking to Ezra. In 1989, I was married. I had a house. had a daughter that was born in 91, son that was born in 93 had this group of friends, unbelievable friends. Every one of them was different than me, though. They all came from intact families, fathers, houses they still go back to, rooms that they still had. But they welcomed me into this group. I thought I had it made. I finally was really happy for the first time in my life. Then I answered a phone. Look. If you believe the caricature of Mark Furman, a guy who supposedly had a copy of Mein Kampf on his mantelpiece during the trial, you know, you're like, well, man, a black Jew, I must be his worst enemy. I don't know how that is supposed to affect what he's seeing, you know, and how he responds. But you you have to, I just sort of got past that quickly because it doesn't help me. You know, I was just interested in having him respond to the experiences that he lived through during the trial and really give him a fair hearing. And I wasn't there to get wrapped up in, oh, are you really a racist? Or how racist are you? And man, this must be really weird for you to be sitting across from me because aren't I the, you know, living manifestation of everything you're supposed to hate? You know, it's like, yeah, okay. I I don't, it's like, it doesn't get you anywhere. And so as far as how he dealt with me, he engaged with me um, very easily and, and fluidly, and we had a, a good rapport, and I appreciate it. And so I have no idea how who I am, you know, affected how he acted and in, in, in the interview. I, I have zero. I have no idea. Another memorable figure in the film is OJ's agent, Mike Gilbert. He stood by his client even after becoming convinced that OJ had killed Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. I asked Ezra about his interview with Mike Gilbert. Uh, you know, Mike Gilbert is a very complex guy. And I think, though, he he speaks to, you know, in some ways, the power and the cultish aspect of celebrity, you know, in our in our culture. Like he's a guy who grew up idolizing OJ and then he got a chance to become his marketing agent, you know, around 1988 or so through his uh, relationship with Marcus Allen, who, who he worked and did the same stuff for him. To me, it's like, it really speaks to what happens when you are enthralled by a human being and sort of you get to this place where, oh my God, I am now working with and spend all this time around one of my childhood heroes. I can't speak to what that does to a person in terms of how that affects them. And, you know, you are very loyal to that person and whether you choose then to see him, that person through, you know, rose colored glasses or it's just a sense of like, you know, again, with a lot of OJ's friends, some of whom, you know, who don't talk. You know, this is this is a guy who I have known since, you know, since he was a kid and I'm loyal to him. And that comes first. Regard- and I don't know what happened or maybe if I did happen. Look, Joe Bell, his friend who's in the film, you know, when you ask him what he thinks about whether O.J. is guilty or innocent. This is a guy who's known O.J. since he was a kid. And, you know, he certainly doesn't want to answer the question, but he sort of says, like, look, if he is guilty, then he needs me more than ever. And Joe Bell became an ordained minister at some point. And so that's the way that he deals with that question. So the idea of someone like Mike Gilbert sticking by him, even after a point where he, he knew him or believed him to be guilty of murder, you know, that's an impossible question to answer. In some ways, it's his meal ticket. And so that's his livelihood. And so I don't know what goes through someone's mind about that choice when it comes to say, oh, no, I have to take a stand now and walk away. It's a, a much more difficult choice than you and I could possibly know. 
you know, but even when someone like Ron Ship, who was in some ways also enthralled by OJ and sort of grew up idolizing him and wanting to be him and ended up being friends with him. Ron Ship was a, a, a cop in the LAPD who befriended OJ, but, you know, was a, and I idolized the guy since he was a teenage football player growing up in, in California. Even when Ron Ship comes to the conclusion that OJ is guilty of murder and he makes a decision to testify against him and he's sort of the lone person who you would consider a friend of OJ's who made that decision, even on the stand during the trial on national television, he still says, well, I still love the guy. Our fifth and final nominee is Raul Peck, the director of I Am Not Your Negro. He has a long filmmaking history spanning documentary and fiction. His directing credits include La Mumba, about the Congolese leader, and Sometimes in April, filmed in Rwanda. Out of this year's three nominated documentaries that deal with race, you could say that O.J. Made in America is the epic, 13th is the lecture, and I Am Not Your Negro is the poem. Raoul constructs the film from the words of James Baldwin, whose commentary from the last century still speaks eloquently to our times. I'm terrified at the moral apathy, the death of the heart, which is happening in my country. These people have deluded themselves for so long that they really don't think I'm human. I had basis on their conduct, not on what they say. And this means that they have become, in themselves, moral monsters. At other points in the film, Baldwin's words are voiced by Samuel L. Jackson over civil rights imagery from past and present. I still believe that we can do with this country something that has not been done before. We are misled here because we think of numbers. You don't need numbers. You need passion. And this is proven by the history of the world. I'm Not Your Negro premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in September, where I sat down with Raoul in front of a live audience. Raoul grew up in Haiti and Congo before studying in Europe and the U.S. I asked when he first encountered Baldwin's writing. Well, uh, as a little boy, like many other black little boy like me, if you were interested in literature, in film, uh, we we would always come to a point where uh, we felt that this book, this film, were not telling our story. It, it did not represent what we were living in our everyday life. And, uh, and at the time, there were not many authors that you could look up to. And as far as my life, well, I, I had Baldwin, Aimé Césaire, and Franz Fanon, basically. But uh, I started reading Baldwin when I was 16. And it, it, it made a big uh, change. It, it really it give, gave me uh, the legitimacy of thinking, of accepting who I was. And it allows me to decipher the world around me. And in a very um, poetic way, real way, because he's at, at the same time uh, a great... Uh, I would say, theorist and uh, rhetoric. Uh, and at the same time, it's about the, your... Theorist, theorist not theorist. terrorist. Yeah, terrorist. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this day is dangerous to, to <laughs> misspell that. Uh, and at the same time, it, it was about your daily life. You know, how, how do you watch film? How do you interact in, in a civil situation uh, every day uh, of your life? So... Uh, for a very long time, I, I felt like I grew, grew up with Baldwin, and, and when I was in my 20s, uh, I realized that I was saying a lot of things that were, in fact, Baldwin's. Hmm. For me, he was always part of my life. It, it's a kind of, uh, uh, of person, uh, and I say person, but because it was not just his book. In that you you were kind of watching how he conducted himself in public? Is, is of that course, what you mean? of course. And he was, don't forget, uh, in, in the 60s, 70s, uh, he was probably the only black uh, artist and intellectual that you would see. 
Baldwin had developed many movie ideas before he died in 1987. Among them, he had written a script about the life of Malcolm X for Billy D. Williams to play. I asked Raul what he thought about Baldwin's unfulfilled movie dreams. He wanted to do so much and without having really the infrastructure for it. Uh, he wanted to write plays. He did play, uh, wrote uh, a few plays. Uh, he wanted to write screenplays. And uh, I read, the, uh, if, I think it's published, the um, uh, Malcolm X screenplay. But of course, it's, it's unfilmable. It's, it's like it would cost 500 million. <laughs> Uh, you know, he has uh, in, in some, in three lines, there are, you know, just one setup where you see a lot of uh, birds and flies, and that would cost a million to, just to do that. <laughs> but again, uh, it, I, I like the poetry of the way he, he wrote that screenplay. And, and today you would do probably uh, three seasons uh, of, of, on Malcolm X with that which is the ambition he had to those people were so important that they should have that much uh, screen time. And, um, but at the same time, it's, it was almost too early. I mean, today Baldwin would have, a, would have agent, manager, mm -hmm. companies, everything, you know, like a lot of today's, the, the rappers, they, they are doing, they are in fashion, they are in, mm -hmm. in record, they are in this and, you know, this business takes a, a big part of that. And at the time, Baldwin did not have that kind of infrastructure and, and demand. So, but those, um, a, a lot of that work are for me sometimes incomplete, of course, but they are important because uh, he touches each time the basis of very important subjects. He was like the first one to open all your eyes to, the, to those projects. At the 2016 Toronto Festival, there was an unmistakable prominence of black filmmakers with works like Moonlight and A United Kingdom, along with I Am Not Your Negro. I asked Raoul if he thought there was a new momentum for black filmmakers. Ah, that's a difficult question. Uh, I can try to answer it differently. First of all, I don't believe in those momentums. I've seen too many of them all, all my life, all, all my professional life. Uh, in fact, I, I may say that I'm one of the few in my generation who survived. I know a lot of good friends who, who had film in Cannes, who won prizes in Cannes, who today cannot find money to make their films. Uh, my elders, people that, who I'm, I look up to, uh, because they were the only one I could uh, watch as example of what I wanted to do, People like Charles Burnett, like Aile Gerima, like uh, Billy Rudbury, all those people, they hardly, Aile is, is still trying to make his film. Charles Burnett is still trying to make films. And so, uh, and I've seen other who came after them, who, who again made two, three films, or, or people, women, uh, people like Julie Dash, all those great women. Uh, who disappeared at some point and were struggling and to make their film. And th those were important people for, for, for cinema. There, there are uh, somebody like Carl Franklin. I remember the, uh, the, the one false move. When I saw this movie, I was blown away. And for me, I said, wow, he made it. He's going to be the next Spielberg. Did not happen. And he made some film, and he's still working, I think. He's doing a lot of uh, television series. And, but those people, they should have a, a pile of money and choose whatever project they want to make. And uh, so to, to answer your question is, I don't know what the way will be or how we will get that. First of all, I think we will never get it from the industry. The industry will never say, here, do it, unless we take it. And, uh, and the result for me is to be able to be in a room with an executive uh, to whom I pitch my project. I have half an hour and where I don't need to spend 25 minutes of that half an hour to explain who James Baldwin is and why he is important. <laughs> 
for me, that's the result we want to have. Whether you are a woman, whether uh, you are gay, whether you are an Asian, uh, we should be able to enter a room with somebody who know where we come from, who know our history, <laughs> and and where we can then have a discussion about film, about the process of making this particular film, and with what uh, uh, means you want to do it, to what for what audience, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, to talk film, and not to have to convince that you exist. There you have this year's Oscar nominees for documentary feature. I hope you get to see all of them. These conversations were excerpted from longer interviews on Pure Nonfiction. See our show notes for links to those episodes. Pure Nonfiction is distributed by the TIFF Podcast Network. Thanks to our team, series producer, Michael Scotty Jr., sound mixer, Kyle Murphy, web designer, Cross Strategy, marketing coordinator, Sarah Modo, social media master, Jordan Smith, and executive producer, Rafaela Nehausen. I'm Tom Powers. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-O-M Powers. If you're in New York, Look for me on Tuesday nights at the IFC Center for our screening series, Stranger Than Fiction. You can read our show notes, learn about live events, and sign up for our newsletter at purenonfiction.net.